Hey guys, check it out! I finally got one of these theme months that all the real YouTubers have. That's right, for the whole of the month of June, we're sticking to one subject and one subject only, and I'll be doing this for years past when I run out of ideas. As a famous wagon hitcher, I've hitched my wagon to Nickelodeon. Who doesn't have fond memories of watching classic Nicktoons like SpongeBob and Fairly Odd Parents, getting into heated arguments about whether or not Avatar is anime, and immediately turning tail and watching Cartoon Network on Channel 60 when those orange pricks tried to get me to go outside? As one of the most popular stations on TV with a lineup of classic shows, games were sure to follow, and that's what we're going to be looking at. What better place to start than with the big shot of the station himself, SpongeBoy Ahoy! background on the channel and Spongebob in general, Nicktoons was launched in 1979 by Warner Brothers, and you can just tell from their first logo, look, you can smell the wood finish on this thing. The name itself came from The Nickelodeon, which was a theater that would show movies on the cheap. You know, for a nickel. Still working on where the Odeon comes from. These were popular back in the 1910s, you know, pre-Great Depression, and for some reason they chose to theme the entire channel after a time period you have to ask your grandpa about. Introducing Nickelodeon, children's programming that's fit for children. 13 hours of programming a day, seven days a week, that will make them wonder, laugh, ponder, and think. Ah yes, youth of America, come to enjoy the satellite provided broadcast of the Nickelodeon Young People's Channel on your home entertainment center. So what were Nickelodeon up to in these early years? Surely they were just pumping out some of those Nicktoons we all know and love. You got a dancing mime, what more can you ask for? Yeah, Nickelodeon was not only not a very engaging channel from its inception, it was a massive loss leader seeing as the channel basically had no way to turn a profit. They were paid to make the shows, not get people to watch them. Worse yet is that there were no ads on the channel, so there was no money to be made there. But then what took up the time that should have been for the ads? Bring back the mime! Nickelodeon was such a massive money pit that to make up for its failing, it was partnered with its much cooler brother, MTV. See, when you have a channel that changed the way TV was used and a channel whose main attraction was, again, a fucking dancing mime, might as well use one to pick up the slack of the other. 1981 was when Nickelodeon's fortunes didn't so much turn as they did briefly glance over their shoulder in the right direction as they managed to poach the Canadian sketch comedy show You Can't Do That on Television and drag it across the border. Not only was it the first time Nickelodeon had a show worth watching that didn't involve character actor Jonathan Schwartz dressed as the Charlie Chaplin that birthday places rent out when they can't get the rights to the real thing, but gave Nick what was essentially their lifeblood. Green Slime. This paved the way for Double Dare, a game show that practically drenched itself in the stuff and would be another hit for the channel. However, you can't keep a channel going on two good shows because Nickelodeon was failing and fast. No amount of miming could possibly pull him out of a hole this bad. Let me put it in perspective. In 1985, out of all cable TV channels, Nickelodeon ranked last. LAST! You don't think about the fact there has to be a least viewed channel to go along with the most viewed, do you? Nobody looks at the lowest selling games in a year, except for me, for a sick form of catharsis. Look, I might not be able to know how to tie my own shoes, but at least I'm not Babylon's fall. So yeah, disaster was a bit of a light word to describe the channel's conditions, but things were gonna be different. See, taping them to MTV to hide how badly they were doing was finally paying off, as when Viacom bought MTV for over $400 million, Nick was bought as well. Now, most people would see that they just had the worst rated channel and all of television dropped into their hands and in turn throw it in a dumpster. Not Viacom. They for some reason thought they could just spit shine Nick so that it would outshine its rivals, Cartoon Network and the Disney Channel. First order of business, make kids actually want to watch it. This is where they took cues from MTV. When I say MTV, you probably think of ridiculousness, uh, ridiculousness, ridiculousness, uh, then maybe 20 more ridiculousnesses, and then you get to the old bumpers. These were pretty much what sold the network. They're iconic, they're memorable, they were contemporary, colorful, and cool. It took being named the worst channel on all of television to think that maybe some of that colorfulness should be carried over to the channel made for children. The rebranding was a go-go, bringing in the instantly recognizable shade of Nickelodeon orange, the splat logo, and the jingle that in some way, shape, or form persists today. Ready for the story to get a lot more confused? Confusing because it's about to. In 1991, Viacom decided that now would be a pretty good time to introduce cartoons to the network. Yet for about 12 years, this channel made for kids was completely bereft of cartoons. Why would we need cartoons? We have the mime! These weren't going to be any old cheaply made cartoons licensed out to some outside animation company though, as they were going to be done in-house. Animation made by Nick for Nick. The initiative began on August 11th when three shows premiered. We had Doug, Ren and Stimpy, and Rugrats. The first three Nicktoons. 
hearts. Now, to call Doug boring would be to call fire hot, but in spite of that, it was a smashing success! Now the floodgates were open and creator-driven animation was all the rage. While a lot of animation up until this point was made with the intention of selling toys to kids, Nick wanted to do things differently. They weren't going to make shows like Transformers or He-Man where the aim was to get the kids interested in the next big toy to buy. These were shows made by the animators. The people who made the cartoons would actually have control over what they made. As a result, all sorts of cartoons were made that to this day remain vital pieces of the television animation medium. Angry Beavers, Ah, Real Monsters, Rocco's Modern Life, Hey Arnold, Cat Dog, Wild Thornberries. This was a channel that went from undesirable to undeniable. By 1995, less than a decade after being called unwatchable, Nickelodeon was the number one TV station in America. Moreover, they've kept that spot for the last 35 years! Things didn't slow down either once the Y2K bug flopped. Nick was cranking out more cartoons that defined a generation. Fairly Odd Parents, Jimmy Neutron, Invader Zim, My Life as a Teenage Robot, Danny Phantom, Avatar The Last Airbender. Sure, they made a cat scratch every now and again, but you've had your fly down in public before you've done a cat scratch too. There was no denying that by the mid-2000s, Nick was still at the top of their game. They were hosting a yearly extravagant award show, the Kids' Choice Awards, that had highest paid man in the history of time and 10-time world heavyweight champion and Dwayne the Dwayne Dwayneson hosting. They managed to get a hotel modeled in their image that let you sleep under the watchful gaze of Cosmo and could even take the hit of just giving up on showing anything for a whole day in the futile attempt to get kids to go outside their house and play. Fun fact, did you know that this happened on one of the Worldwide Days of Play? It's Nickelodeon's Worldwide Day of Play. We're outside playing, and you should be too. We'll be back in The following message is transmitted at the request of the Salt Lake City Police Department. There is a fire at the Tesoro Refinery in Salt Lake City. Toxic materials may be burning in the fire, and anyone exposed to these chemicals may be injured. I was just doing what SpongeBob told me to do! Ah! Nowadays, Nicktoons is terrible. I mean, look at this. What is this? I don't understand this. Nickelodeon was so much better when I was a kid. Now they just have Grinch mechs, Dwongo and Pimboli, Hoist Moist Poist, and Rugrats! Why can't these shows be less for children and more logic-based like the shows of my childhood? Like Rowdy Rui's Big Kablooey, Cockbone, and The Days of Our Lives as Leaky Pipes! Cartoons aren't made for children, they're made for me! What I'm trying to say is the cartoons aren't getting worse, you're getting older. Don't you have a wife or something? Why do you care about Large Antonio? Also, some of the cartoons are worse, that is part of it. But one big yellow elephant in the room I've been working so hard to dance around fell out of the mind prison of Steven Hillenburg. A talented man from an age where most men were called boys, you know, childhood, Stephen had two passions, art and the ocean. It all started back with the Jacques Cousteau oceanography films, which let him see a world unlike any other. He'd grow up to not only be a band geek, get it, and work as a fry cook, get it, but would also end up moving to Arcata, California to pursue a degree in marine sciences with an art minor. It was there that the roots of his biggest hit would be planted with the scientific comic The Intertidal Zone. In it was a character named Bob the Sponge, and unlike the completely unrealistic one that we ended up with, his design was actually based on a sea sponge. Can't you just see yourself eating cereal with this friendly face on the cover? Eventually, Steven decided the picture should probably stretch out and start moving more and got to work animating, creating shorts like The Green Beret and Wormholes, which eventually led him to a directing job on Rocco's Modern Life. This would launch him into pitching his own show, which crossed over his two loves of animation and all things wet into this new show all about a fry cooking sponge and his wacky friends. That's right, Sponge Boy Ahoy, except he couldn't actually call it that because Big Mop would punch him in the stomach till he threw up if he did. Slightly more fun Fun fact than the last not very fun fact, the story of Spongeboy being unavailable as a name thanks to a mop brand is very popular, but I can't actually find any mop that was called Spongeboy, so Big Mop once again using its power to keep down the animation industry. Soon Spongeboy had his Y hacked off and a B was sewn on in its place as SpongeBob SquarePants premiered on July 17th, 1999, and while it was no mime, it saw similar levels of success. The other Nicktoon shows were cultural touchstones. SpongeBob is cultural bedrock. Everybody of a certain age could pretty much recite any given SpongeBob episode from memory. For the record, if anybody needs it, I got reef blowers down pat. Stick a bunch of jaded, foggy-eyed teens in a room together and watch them communicate exclusively in SpongeBob quotes. It's astonishing how universal the appeal of the show was. It wasn't a boy's show or a girl's show. It wasn't action-packed or boring. It was SpongeBob. It was three seasons of all but solid gold television. And while I'd argue you can probably bump that up to four seasons and the new stuff from like 
season 10 onwards, whenever the second movie came out, every season after that has been really good, those first three seasons are where the most love lies. That isn't to say that's where the success stopped, however. Over 200 episodes, three theatrical films of descending quality, a theater production in which they got the Mad Dog himself to play Plankton, and more merch than God will know what to do with after humans are gone, SpongeBob has more than left his mark on the world as a whole. Another world that SpongeBob has left his mark on was the digital world, as there was more SpongeBob games than I personally know what to do with. I could have made this video about a lot of different SpongeBob games like Lights, Camera, Pants, Employee of the Month, or Cosmic Shake, but that doesn't exist yet, so it would be very hard to make a video. It all started in 2001 when they finally managed to trap SpongeBob on the Game Boy with Legends of the Lost Spatula on March 15th, before dividing and conquering the PC with Operation Krabby Patty on September 24th, and Super Sponge on November 21st for the Game Boy Advance, and PlayStation, which is most notable for the filthy pornography left on the game disc. That is not a joke! That is deadly serious! However, the first big attempt at a SpongeBob console game for the sixth generation would have to wait until 2002 when the PS2 and GameCube got hit in the back of the head with Revenge of the Flying Dutchman. This was a game that ended up being so not very good that the developers immediately died after finishing it. It's clunky buggy, and reeks of a studio that had to try to continue after their French parent company died in the middle of development of a Jimmy Neutron game that they later had to have the code reworked into a playable demo presented to Nickelodeon that landed them the contract to make the game in a crunch. It's a lavender scent, a bit of walnut. This was such a scarring experience for Nickelodeon, they decided to wait a full year before trying to fail again, which saw them teaming with Heavy Iron Studios, who are best known for nothing, and who have since gone on to make a game for the stadium, meaning all hope is lost. The game that resulted from this partnership was SpongeBob Battle for Bikini Bottom. This game needs no introduction, except for this one. Battle for Bikini Bottom is one of the most beloved and well-regarded platformers of its time. Collectathon games in the vein of banjo kazooie Zooey or Mario 64 were on their way out, and instead of caving to the intense demand to give SpongeBob a gun, they instead decided to stick to what didn't work last time with Revenge of the Flying Dutchman and keep it collectible. Needless to say, it turned out a little better. Battle for Bikini Bottom is still regarded as a prime example of how to make a licensed game, and has gotten a whole new wave of popularity thanks to its speedrunning potential. Talking about the speedrunning history of this game is way more interesting than talking about the game itself, with it being found that strategic grime can be employed to glitch the game disc in your favor. This technique is not called the Dirty Dan strategy, meaning that no real SpongeBob fans play this game. This is a licensed game, a licensed kids game from the early 2000s that is so well regarded, it got a remake. A remake! You don't need a video game to advertise Spongebob anymore. It's Spongebob. That's like trying to advertise air. People just love the game so much that they saw the market for people who want to play it again. I can't speak enough to the fact that Spongebob Rehydrated Existing is really weird and in equal measures really cool. Speaking of speaking, why aren't I talking about that game instead of this one? I mean, I beat it in preparation for this video. Uh, well, see, I have this friend, uh, his name is, um, um, Jack with two Ks, and he played it and thought that while Spongebob, Patrick, and especially Sandy all controlled really well, the levels were fun, vibrant, and full of references that early season Spongebob fans will flip for, and the game very obviously wears its Mario 64 inspirations on its sleeves, uh, the grind to collect golden spatulas towards the end of the game, frustrating missions like the ball rolling which my friend Jack, not me Jack, Jack my friend, wanted me to show you this footage to show that he is at least smarter than an IGN critic, and the real repetitive feel towards the end keep it from being an amazing 3D platformer, but he does acknowledge that it's still fun and Spongebob fans especially will have a great time. Also, I never played the game when I was younger, I was a Spongebob movie boy myself. For all the talk that Battle for Bikini Bottom gets, nobody can seem to spare the time to talk about the tying game to my favorite movie. This is not a joke. I've written multiple page long college essays on the SpongeBob movie, and if this video gets a million views, I'll let you read them. This movie holds a special place in my heart, as I've probably seen this movie more times than I've seen my own parents. If you want to know how permanently this movie has destroyed my ability to function in everyday society, I have an intensely negative reaction to the song Ocean Man for no other reason than I associate it with the SpongeBob movie ending. I was obsessed with this film when I was younger, as opposed to now, obviously, and I simply had to get the game that goes along with it. I would play it all the time. I can probably beat the first level with my eyes closed, and what I can't say I ever did was complete the whole thing. Collect everything the game had to offer, and as the maiden voyage for the sure to be long running and influential Nick June, we'll be seeing if I can finally do what a six-year-old couldn't and completely complete the SpongeBob movie game.
So, going over the plot of the game would just be a note-for-note -note retelling of the story of the movie, which most days I would be up to, but this time I think I'll hold back. Uh, tell you what, two million views, I'll get blackout drunk and record myself recapping the story, or pissing myself, whichever one comes first. What you may notice off the bat, and especially as things progress, is holy heck were these cutscenes cheaply made! And not the in-game ones, they're as good as Battle for Bikini Bottom, but when they bust out the vacation slideshow that's been replaced with the postcard collection recounting the Spongebob movie, there's a problem! Look at this, this is just clip art of Spongebob! It's the same Spongebob that would show up on specially marked jugs of orange juice! Well, the reason for that is because they only had a year to make the game, because it had to be out in time for the movie! And surely these scenes would have been fully animated like the rest, but they simply held off and used stills. What's funnier is that the reason they couldn't just use clips from, oh, I don't know, the Spongebob movie was because the release date was like a double-edged sword, except both edges jabbed into your body. Since the game came out before the movie, Nickelodeon straight up wouldn't let them use footage for fear of harming the film's chances of being a success. Seeing those box office results... <laughs> Barely made it. So the first level proper, and it's a tutorial to the game in the form of SpongeBob's manager dream. Not only do we get a pretty snazzy one-time costume, but we figure out the lay of the land. Returning from battle for Bikini Bottom is the spin attack, and... Well, that seems to be it at first. Just jumping, spinning, and occasionally sliding down on your tongue. Two big things that you find out in this level are the secret chests, which unlock bonuses like concept art, costumes, and a cutscene viewer, and the weights. You see, men lift weights, so to be more man equals more weight. Unlike Battle for Bikini Bottom, where collecting shiny objects just got you more spatulas, weights in this game allow you to upgrade your skills. Right now, all I got is upgrading my health and my spin, but when I do, I get the ability to hit projectiles back. This is an advantage that took me a very long time to unlearn in Battle for Bikini Bottom. It also carries over the combo system, which means the more stuff you break in a chain, the more weights you get, which makes big box stacks and enemy hordes a lot more fun to tackle. So after SpongeBob gets the Goofy Goober token and gets rejected, for his promotion, we move on to the best name for a level in a game and get introduced to Patrick. He plays pretty much the same as he did in Battle for Bikini Bottom, just better, since they swapped out his belly bump for a spin attack, which instantly makes him 10 times more fun to play as, because the belly bump could not hit anything. Of course, this upgrade did come at the cost of losing Sandy as a playable character, seeing as I think she has two lines in the whole movie, it makes sense, and at least her lasso got grandfathered in as Patrick's tongue. So Spongebob's getting sloshed at the Goofy Goober and being a good friend, we go to pick him up. Here is where we meet the first real enemies of the game in this big belching be- friend and these broomstick swingers. They're taken out pretty easily, and in our way we find a few simple platforming challenges, including one that tries to trick me into missing a chest, but let me tell you, little baby Jack would never forget this location. It's my holy site! It's here we run into Neptune's daughter Mindy, bafflingly still voiced by Scarlett Johansson, and she says she can teach Patrick a new move as she brings her two Goofy Goober tokens. I only have one Goofy Goober token, and there's a conveniently placed combat arena panel next to her. Well, if I didn't know any better- These panels take you to tons of different challenges, in the game. The combat ones ask you to take on wave after wave of enemies Dynasty Warrior style. These are nice little diversions focusing on the combat instead of the platforming, but you have to be careful since the enemies always have a boost from what you're used to. We clear the challenge and learn the cartwheel, which lets us break through a wall to get an extra token. <laughs> they don't call me Jack knows where all the Goofy Goober tokens are in the Spongebob movie game for GameCube last name for nothing. After that is a mini battle arena with boxes and weights littered all over the place and an ice cream room right after that. Some may call it gimmicky, but for all the odd ways Patrick Patrick's cartwheeling interacts with it is a worthwhile addition. After performing a pro move and getting another chest, it's on to the last arena. It's here that I pop my upgrade and get the Macho Cartwheel. It takes the normal Patrick and makes him say, I'll cut off your nutsack and nail it to my door! The best part is that on the way here, I skipped quite a few tokens I can't get to because I don't have the upgrades to do so. Unlike the last game, which went for more Mario 64 style, this goes for more Mario Galaxy, where it's a straight shot to the end with diversions to get more goodies. Oh yeah, Mario Galaxy's so influential, but does he ever get wasted on a triple gooberberry sunrise? Sh game! So after sobering up, which is done with more drinking, by the way, Spongebob curses out Mr. Krabs and sets his life on a six-day countdown. We gotta, in order, get the crown, save the town, and Mr. Krabs. Of course, we aren't getting anywhere without a car, so we speed off in the paddy wagon. Next is a driving level, one of the original additions to this game. We just gotta make it to the end of the track without dying, made much harder by these blatant OSHA violations. Of course, where others see workplace negligence, I see opportunity as they let me cut right through the track. It's not a long drive to the end, and Mindy even gives us a token. We drive to the city limits where our car is immediately burgled. Well, at least these nice men have some sympathy. <laughs> Chill City 3,000 Miles Ahead is next and... 
Nah, I'm not feeling it. Nah, I'm just not playing this level. Not at least without three more Goofy Goober tokens. See, for each driving mission, there's your regular playthrough, the time trial, a ring challenge, and macho time. They're all exactly what you expect they'd be, and that includes macho time. Whatever your first thought was, correct. I cleared them all real quick, and now I have more than enough for the uppercut, which is an ability SpongeBob had originally in his base moveset in Battle for Bikini Bottom that is now locked behind some progression. What isn't locked for long, though, is the macho uppercut, which is a remote explosive. They're really good for dealing with the spitters, which you can either take out by reflecting their vomit or by giving them the old up-the-butt special with your uppercut. To clear this level, we gotta take out Plankton's radio tower, since he wasn't even waiting till we left to enact Plan Z. Before getting much further, we also have a Sponge Bowl challenge panel, which follows the baffling trend of early 2000s platformers being mandated by the government to include Super Monkey Ball. In Battle for Bikini Bottom, the ball is used maybe three times outside of just playing around with it in the overworld. Here, it's given a spotlight as one of the three panels. Here, you get to travel in these voids over tricky tracks in order to get the token. I call it Super Monkey Ball, but truly nothing controls like the Sponge Bowl. And that's a good thing. This thing's physics are finicky and loose, but in the same way that someone can play Super Monkey Ball and not want to join those weird YouTube monkey hate comment trains, look it up. I actually enjoy these segments. I shouldn't enjoy this because these sections were clearly made just to make kids cry, but I am not a kid. I'm a big boy! The accomplishment comes just from managing to wrangle the controls in just the right way that you can wrestle the win away from the game instead of just the standard platforming. What I'm saying is that I like that it's unfair. We also get two more tokens simply by bouncing along and bungee jumping with our underpants. It's a living. We also get a shot at another token in a Patrick panel. This one is all about platforming as opposed to combat and masochism like the other two. Just get to the token to win. It's what's between you and that that's the problem. He probably isn't, but Patrick just feels heavier than SpongeBob, so to give him the platforming challenges is quite cruel. You'll encounter a few different block types like bouncy blocks, ice blocks, and cock blocks, which are always fun to run into. At the finish line, you- Oh man, the acid I bought two years ago is finally kicking in! Another quick battle arena and Patrick swing and puzzle later, and this level is history. For all my hard work collecting chests, I get a trailer! Bigger. <laughs> squarier. Spongier. What the fuck is this movie? After that is a sliding mission, which is just like the driving mission, except stopping is something non-macho men do, and I am the machoist man, so there's no stopping. You just gotta keep going down the track and hit targets to destroy more towers. First go around is easy enough, but this and all the other sliding challenges are absolutely brutal in the other three challenges. For this stage, the time trial is fine since I got a good idea on the shortcuts, but there's only so much you can do for the ring challenge. It requires a perfect playthrough of the track on paths that you can miss by a hair and be sent barreling back to the beginning since ring challenges give you no checkpoints. This bit at the end with the wobbling stones is hell on earth and added more runs than I'd like to admit. The macho time as well as no cakewalk but I got it on my second try, as opposed to my twelfth try with the ring challenge. Just limit yourself to single jumps whenever you can, because double jumps tend to kill momentum. By the start of the next level, we've managed to track down the paddy wagon to the only building for miles, the Thug Tug. Here we get the butt smash, which can be upgraded pretty much immediately into the macho butt smash. It's a slam that lets you stun enemies and is best at taking out the dog walkers, who are impossible to approach otherwise. Also, watching Patrick land face first on the ground with a super loud has remained funny for a decade. We gotta get the paddy wagon key back, and in our way is brand new TNT barrels, as well as enemies who can hide in the wall and shoot at you as soon as you get close. Luckily for us, they don't actually have any defense from just going up and smashing them, so we're in the clear. The Thug Tug is a solid mix of at least decent platforming challenges mixed with fun combat arenas, including their Disco Room and Evil Lava Layer, which I assume is the VIP lounge. We got another combat arena with enemies that are quite a bit faster than you're gonna be ready for before making our way to the lava part I mentioned. Another sponge bowl, which adds these rotating tunnels later, and we slide all the way back down to the beginning, where we get ambushed and have to fight our way back to the possession of the key. It's our lucky day, though, since the gates outside are locked and give us a new driving mission. Again, all the missions in this one are pretty tricky, but the ring one is especially painful. With this one, you not only get taken around every possible route on the track, you also have hairpin turns that you need to make one after the other, with the penalty being either missing your chance or zooming right past the ring. The macho time is pretty strict, but at least it gives you some wiggle room. Rings mean you either get it on your first try or all the way off. Out of sight, out of mind, and we stop to get some ice cream. As a lactose intolerant, this is just what ice cream does to my insides regardless. This is a boss fight, the first of its kind, and it's the hardest part of the entire game. Ah, crap, I had my notes upside down one second. Um, it's actually easy. Just knock down the frogfish, knock around the lady when she comes to get you, and get a token. 
This is in a similar vein to most, if not all, platforming bosses being a lot harder before you were out of the third grade. Sadly, despite winning, we still lose our car and are faced with a deep, dark trench. SpongeBob and Patrick feel like giving up till Mindy gives them a pep talk and a pair of mustaches before they're ready to go. What in the movie was a 20 second joke of them falling is turned into one of the more hair pulling levels in the game as we're back on the slide. For those keeping track in the audience, that's three levels in a row that aren't typical platforming. This track, though, not only is it long, so when the ring challenge comes, it requires 100% attention lest you get sent back to the start, the macho time is brutal. You have the chance to take intended shortcuts in the track, but I find that the best thing to do is to find the ones that were either never meant to be used or were meant to be used and were put there by a crazy person. See this right here? Uh, this is a skip. Hop off the sea monster's back, take a hit, skip a good part of the track. Here, fall on a bit of the track while going the wrong way, then follow the weights to safety. There's so many different paths and tunnels that you kind of have to mix and match to see which one's going to get you where you need to go the fastest. The saddest is when you think you have it and you see the finish line heart full of hope until you notice, oh, I am not getting there in time. I actually realized I'm not a man, so I think I'll just sit this one out. Some people may think that art, nature, their significant others, babies are beautiful. Can they really compare to a perfect macho time run through of rock slide? Get a life, loser! So on to rock bottom itself, and I think it's about time I bring up just how impressive it is this game was made in a calendar year. The easy way out would have just been to go through reskins of Battle for Bikini Bottom levels. Just go back to Jellyfish Fields, Kelp Forest, maybe throw in a thug tug and call it a day. But playing these back to back, I can barely see any reused assets, and the new environments they did make look amazing. This game takes scenes from the movie and fleshes them out into these visually amazing and fully realized platforming levels. Think about what they're actually working with. The Goofy Goober scene, three minutes. The Trench, about two. They took these short scenes and managed to make these levels feel like they fit right into the world. I don't think they get enough credit for how different they managed to make this game look in so little time. Not just look, but sound! My least favorite part of Battle for Bikini Bottom was definitely the music. It kind of just felt like all the songs in the game were imported from a royalty-free Hawaiian music CD that you find at a flea market. Nothing in the game sounded like it was made for the game. Here, the songs not only sound a lot better, but are super well themed to their levels. I'm Ready Depression sounding like a melting Chuck E. Cheese jukebox, Bubble Blow and Baby Hunt sounding like they booked Motorhead's non-union Mexican equivalent, and while 3,000 Miles to Shell City reuses the driving level theme, it's super fitting and still sounds just like a jug band. As for Now That We're Men, this is another good platforming test with a much bigger emphasis on enemy fights than any other stage, especially in its combat panel, which has endgame enemies and massive waves with quick attacks that manages to steal 30 minutes of my life. The majority of the back half of the level is made up with this combination trampoline lava puzzle that needs you to use your new power up the bowling ball to set these bouncy pads at the right height so you can get from one to the next. After a fun ride on the back of the lava monster you bounced off in rock slide, you get an elevator of death as waves of enemies come to kill you. Just before the end of the level we have a chance to grab another token and a floating block challenge that really puts your feet to the fire with sections that mix and match all the blocks, adding in new ones like slippery ice blocks and blocks that never stop rotating, and the end of the challenge having you fall all the way past down these moving spike blocks, and if anybody you meet doesn't do a macho slam off the top rope, you can still be friends with them, uh, just make sure to keep pepper spray on you in case they go for a handshake. After that, I guess to make up for keeping us on the racing track for so long, they give us the double whammy of platforming levels. Fresh out of the trenches, the devs manage to turn a scene that takes less than a single footstep into an entire level. This one is a junkyard where you have to smash all the screens broadcasting Plankton's message to no one. The most heavily populated area of them all! A soda can. Aw, look at that. Heavy Iron put a reference to themselves on the license plate. That's so sweet. All right, nobody likes a narcissist. Cut it out. Here, Patrick gets his final ability to throw stuff, which immediately goes macho, which lets us throw stuff further. Not only can you throw melons, but boxes and even stunned enemies. Stun them with a slam and then toss them. It's his last power up, and it does pretty substantially change how you approach puzzles and enemies. The ability to snipe tough enemies so you don't have to deal with them is great, especially these bucket copters who are the toughest the game has to offer. This level is full of great challenges like a rising acid pit that leads us to another token, a tongue swinging challenge, and another one we'll cover in a bit. On our way out, the game is really racking up the difficulty, putting our carrying abilities to the test before we even leave the level we got it in. However, it's a quick hop, skip, and a jump to the end of the level and the fight with Dennis. Now, I know people dog on the Mermaid Man and Mr. Krabs in Battle for Bikini Bottom for sounding like their fifth choice to voice the character. Pesky robot has taken over me ticket booth. If you help me get rid of that no good robot. But we also gotta give props to the guy who voices Dennis for sounding absolutely nothing like Alec Baldwin. Don't worry, this'll only hurt a lot! <laughs> I love this job!
For his fight, all you gotta do is toss stuff at him until he dies, but he's not gonna let you win that easy, since you have to not only survive him using SpongeBob as a mallet, but the waves of enemies he sends to get you. Targeting with the throw is just ever so clunky, and as a result, you're locked in place just long enough for something to hit you. After you give him the business, the business is then thrown right back in your face. What in the movie plays out is a bittersweet scene where SpongeBob and Patrick tearfully walk together into oblivion after accepting that you can't live your life by other people's standards and finding solace with the very thing that they were mocked for, punctuated as they shed a tear and let out a defiant song with their last breath, becoming men in their own way, is replaced with FUN CLOWN CHASE THE PEANUT COLORS LIGHT SOUNDS FEEL LIKE they flatlined, they're dead, they're gone, they left the mortal plane, the pirates are crying, BIG ol' GUMBALL! This is even more original than the last level seeing as this place does not even exist! As far as the driving stages go, I hate to say it, but this is... This is probably the worst one. Visually, top tier, untouchable. In the tier of not having hairpin turns in large sections where damage is either unavoidable or the ground causes you to smash into walls, let's put it at a solid D tier. I will say though that the shortcuts are tuned up to 11 to the point that shortcuts have shortcuts and they're pretty well marked with this one even advertising the next game. Once the tier of the Goofy Goober revives our heroes, we have to get out of Shell City Gift Shop and it's our final sliding stage. Oh boy, you know what the other levels just had way too much of? Room for error. I was kind of hoping there would be less. Sliding around in King Neptune's crown, you gotta hit the valves to release more water and revive the fish, a lesson that led to a traumatizing realization with a bottle of water and a dead fish on the beach. What makes this level so difficult is just how open it is. Most of the other slide missions kept you on a set track. Here you have tons of options on which way to go, and as such, there are a lot of ways to lose time and get sidetracked. It's actually a really short track when you know where you need to go, and the game knows that and tests you on that when it comes to the macho time. That's not, of course, to discount the ball like that is the ring challenge. You can guess that this wide openness means that they were gonna have a real ball giving you the runaround to get that token. After I get through that, there's no time to rest. Once you finish that, we gotta get back to Bikini Bottom where I said oh right well I can't say anything but let's just say a certain Hoff couldn't be hassled to have his name be used in the game as we ride the Hoff home bigger boot comes back huh so anyway I Dennis is back Dennis is gone! No, I will not be elaborating. Not even Hoff's 800,000 back hairs can keep me here any longer. After finally making it back to Planktopolis, we get the final upgrade, the guitar, which is already a massive upgrade to the bubble missiles of the last game, but is upgraded even more by becoming the Macho Guitar. With it, I can tackle all the challenges in front of me. Or rather, the challenges behind me. Not until I do the three guitar challenges will I be finishing this level. Back in I'm Ready Depression, Bubble Blowing Baby Hunt, and Shell City Dead Ahead, there were challenges to fly through rings using the guitar that I couldn't do until now. I also couldn't do them till now since, as a kid, these were my white whale. I couldn't even tie my own shoes, let alone do something like this. But that changes today. Depression and babies are both beaten as I go on to Shell City Dead Ahead. And with it goes 50 minutes of my life as the sunk cost fallacy takes effect. I wasn't moving on until I got this one right. This one takes you on a guided tour of the entire level, having you fly into walls and make sharp turns that come out of nowhere. Not helped by the generally weird and inverted controls, but I'm finally able to avenge my childhood as I go on to get the token, as well as the other tokens I'm missing in previous levels. It's finally time to take on Plank Top. If it's your first time playing a video game, you might expect this level to be easy, but it's actually the hardest. Every single one of your tools is needed to pass this level. Macho bowling, uppercut, and especially the guitar are all put to the test, as well as tools you've had all along, like the wall jump. Enemies are at their toughest, and platforming is at its trickiest. The copter enemies are now fought in multiples, which means you have little time to reflect really precise shots to take out as many as possible, especially since they're way less generous with the hitbox compared to the vomit guys. These missiles also leave a little shockwave on the ground, which I'm just so so happy they did, I would have just wasted those hit points anyway. The level itself is hard enough, but they also throw in the side challenges. There's a super close bungee challenge, skating on ice with just enough time to get to your goal, and a battle arena which makes the last one seem like a cakewalk. This one took me at least, I don't know, 2,000 tries? <laughs> Thank you.
Jesus, devs, show mercy! The main obstacle for the level are these plankton statues that can blast you from a long distance. Of course, you have the guitar to even your odds, but that doesn't help much when you have to hit them while on a conveyor belt trying to aim at two statues at once. It's obviously the toughest level in the game, but it's just the right challenge. It doesn't throw anything new at you, just throws everything you've faced in the game thus far cranked up to 100. That 100 goes to 101 when you get to the final room. Three copters in the center shooting 15 missiles at you at a time, barely enough time to get a guitar shot off before they wallop you. The best way I found is to just reflect them all until they're dead and make a run for the end because even more enemies show up before the end of the level. At the end of the level though, we find Plankton who came just to brag to us. Fair. We gotta make it to the Krusty Krab 2 before Krabs is killed, and the only way to do that is with another driving section. You may catch on pretty quickly that this track is just the first track in the game flipped and repainted to be Plankton themed. It's honestly a great idea for both saving time and showing how bad things have gotten. In the realm of making it a good course, uh... Okay, first go around and the time trials are fine, but you wouldn't have guessed it, the rings and macho time are brutal. Considering the fact that the whole level might as well be covered in oil for how much is on the ground, I'm shocked that I can even drive straight. This level does really get you thinking, though. Who likes ring sections? Who are these made for? Sir, why did you give the game a 3 out of 10? You said you loved it. WHERE'S THE RING SECTION?! All I'm saying is that any developer that puts a ring challenge in a game that involves racing should just have to pay more taxes at the end of the year. Time to play a game that I plan on including in every single episode from now on, Warhammer 40k or Spongebob plot. Humanity uses technology to entrap, enslave, and make God do their bidding. Vote on your phones now, time's up at Spongebob. To start the fight, Neptune tries to fry you, and all you have to do is dodge three times before he starts screaming, <laughs> Which is one of the funnier combinations of words the English language gave us. It all seems hopeless except for the fact that turning the tables does exactly that. Just flip all the tables in the restaurant and hide behind crabs. Neptune blasts himself and from there you just gotta use the guitar. Repeat this a few times and he'll switch up his attack to this electrical web, which even as a big boy I still have trouble dodging. The timing is just so weird. Once you get him down to the last phase, the music switches to Goofy Goober Rock, a song I had no idea was based on I Wanna Rock by Twisted Sister and did cause a minor crisis of faith when I first heard it out in the wild. It also means I'm turning to another station because Viacom does not play around with copyright. I mean, it's their fault I can't play a clip from the stupid movie without worrying they'll come to my house and try to kill my cats. Okay, that should be better. The level itself also changes up as the game decides that bag fumbling was at an all-time low and throws in these two guys to take the fight down just those few rungs it shouldn't have. The chance to slip slide off the platform while providing clips like this, which, yep, does twist the knife that little bit. Doesn't matter though, as I still get the job done and get to see, ooh, daddy yo, you're telling me this game ships tomorrow? One second, I got a Google image tab open and a dream. I'm in a bit of a weird position here. For years and years, I heard Battle for Bikini Bottom is one of the best SpongeBob games, best licensed games, and best platformers on the GameCube. It's the best. And after playing them back to back, I see everything that people praise Battle for Bikini Bottom for. In the movie game, I had a much better time and generally see this as the more impressive game. Of course, they couldn't have made it this way if they didn't have the BFBBP, Battle for Bikini Bottom Base, but even still, I just think that the movie game is the better game. Is it because I played it as a kid without playing Battle for Bikini Bottom and I love the movie? Yeah, duh, of course it's gonna color my opinion and it doesn't matter. I just think it's a stellar platformer and should probably be mentioned in the same breath as Battle for Bikini Bottom and isn't because speedruns for it haven't taken off. Regardless, I'm just relieved to have come back and seen that this game is still good, and I'm even happier to get Nick June off to a great start! I've got plenty more exciting videos planned for the rest of the month, like, uh... uh like, uh...